Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks very much for joining us uh, for another episode, the second episode of the Paul Redmond Show, the collaboration between Good Teams Win, Great Teams Cover, and the Let's Talk Sports Network, where I come come to you at 7pm uh, UK time, 2pm Eastern time, with a brand new interview each and every week. This week, I'm joined by Matty Smith, um, and we're going to talk... A lot of subjects. We're going to talk about all the content that Matt is involved in and some exciting new stuff that's coming up. We're going to talk about his love of the NFL, the San Francisco 49ers, and we're even going to talk a little bit about his beloved football team, Chelsea, as well. So, Matty, first of all, great to have you on the show uh, and welcome. Thank you, mate. Thank you. I, do you know what? I'm feeling pretty honoured. I, I, like, I think making episode number two, you know, like that's, I'm impressed with this. So when this, like, really, you know, when this really kicks off and you're, you know, you're a big famous podcast, man, I can be like, you know what? I was on episode number two. You go back, you check the, check the history. I was on number two. Uh, so yeah, man, thank you very much for having me. Getting early. That's the key. I think getting <laughs> early. And, 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 and I think that's, that's the, that's the bit. And you'll be a, a forever, forever remembered and uh, thought of very, very well as being such an early guest on the show. In the history of the Paul Redmond show. I was guest number two. I was deemed yeah, we... interesting enough to be number two. I'll take that. Take that. And you can take the the, the first UK guest as well. So oh uh, mate, so... come on. I've I've won already. It's Absolutely. done. It's done. We had Alan on from Oklahoma last week. Um and then we've got you as the first UK guest this week. Nice. So um, speaking of which, uh, real exciting for uh, some work that you're doing and going to be a show that you're starting, um, which is very UK orientated. So yes. uh, Matty, tell us, you've got a new show starting tomorrow. Uh, what is it and where can we find it? So um, it's a new show on the uh, Let's Talk Sports Network, which obviously this this podcast is uh, is part of. Um, and it's basically just going to be an like around the NFL style show, um, but purely hosted by people from the UK. So I guess it's kind of a like a slightly different perspective because like, I never realized until I got into it, like just how big a thing like the NFL is over here. Like it's it is um, it is massive over here and there's kind of such a big following and i think sometimes you know i guess you, we probably do have like a different perspective of it and it's, it's a very different sport to like a lot of things we have going on here so um yeah it's just myself and uh three other um uk nfl fans uh the first episode is going to be tomorrow at 8 p.m uk time um and yeah i'm just i'm really excited to get started uh you know i've, I've really been enjoying sort of diving into the nfl and i think it's just going to be really good to have a yeah i guess just like a a, a uk show about it i'm looking forward to it Excellent, good stuff, and it's interesting the having the UK having a UK show around it. And there's a lot, there's a lot of guys from the UK part. Let's talk sports network, and there's a bit of a or can be a bit of a gap. So I run, I think we talked about just off off camera there, um, a NFL gambling show, right? Good teams mm -hmm. and great teams cover. And I felt, and maybe I'm wrong, but maybe wasn't quite that aspect of the NFL covered in the UK. Some of the sure. guys do and do a really good job of it. The guys at the franchise tag. Podcast do a really good job, mm -hmm. but not a dedicated show. And that's where I thought I could bring something to the NFL UK kind of broadcasting and content. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. And, and you guys coming at it from a different slant as well. Should be fun. Uh, I'll make sure I'm watching tomorrow. Really looking forward to really looking forward to seeing how the first show goes. So let's have a chat then, Matt, about kind of how you got into the NFL to begin with, right? Because there's all, you know, everyone from the UK has a story about how they get into the sports. It's not as naturals maybe is the guys from the us who it's just their sport so they yeah, yeah, yeah. Possibly watch it right so how how did you kind of fall in love with the nfl well mine's a bit silly i won't lie actually to be fair so i um before i sort of got into um like podcasting and stuff like i've been making youtube videos for a while but my main kind of outlet of content i guess is i stream over on twitch so i kind of do all the stuff live and stuff like that which I really enjoy doing stuff live, right? Like I guess what we're doing now and stuff, but I guess doing stuff live is always kind of semi-terrifying because if you if you make a mistake, uh, it is just there. There's no editing it. There's no getting rid of it. It's just out there. And um, I think especially streaming on Twitch, that's something you learn um, pretty early doors that you can't really get away with. Uh, you know, people won't let you forget your mistakes. I have many clips on my channel of me saying... Uh, you know, messing up my words, saying quite, quite terrible things. And, um, you know, my chat, don't let me forget about it. And I'm glad they don't. They keep me humble. They make me remember who I am. Um, but basically when I, uh, so I'm like a massive F1 fan and a massive football fan. And those are always my kind of two things. I play like the F1 game or FIFA or something. And um, a lot of the people that used to watch uh, my Twitch channel were obviously fans of those sports, but were really into the NFL as well. And they had quite a lot of American viewers as well who were all into the NFL. 
And um, I remember it was, yeah, I guess around sort of like February ish. And they were all like, oh, like Madden's on sale. Just buy it. And I was like, OK, I've always really wanted to give it a try. Like, why not? Um, so I bought it and uh, my chat lovingly uh, talked me through all of the rules of the NFL, <laughs> some of which I still don't understand. Um, but they kind of talked to me um, play by play through like, everything. And we started a franchise mode. There was a whole thing. It was really cool. And um, yeah, I kind of just do what I always do. Uh, I'm quite a phasey person and went from just knowing nothing about NFL to being like genuinely obsessed with it. And um, I'd literally play like nothing but Madden all the time. So I, I kind of got really into the game first and um, and then kind of actually started watching it off the back of that, um, which is probably probably the wrong way around i feel like people normally watch it first and they're like oh I'll, I'll play the game of it but no i i decided i would never i couldn't be that simple could it come on it's more common than you think and um, my co one of co-hosts for, for my show did exactly the same thing oh really uh, yeah an early madden game a long time ago but yeah an early <laughs> madden game. and yeah that's kind of how it, how he got into it so yeah it's, it's funny how we kind of fall into oh, nice. these things um, so with your love of the NFL, you are a San Francisco 49ers fan. Yes. Uh, so, you know, we are, I'm Dallas Cowboys fan, so we should, we shouldn't really get on, but. No, we, do you know what? You're not my only friend that is actually, to be fair. I've, oh, uh, again, I've, I've learned this from my short time in the NFL that yeah, Cowboys and Niners aren't ideally friends, but somehow it, it seems to keep happening. It does. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think we will, uh, there'll be plenty of big games and playoff games over these next two years with the, the, the way the two sides are, are built at the minute. So yeah, again, it might be someone talk about why the Niners. So what was it about the San Francisco 49ers that? So, these are the ones? <laughs> so again, it's, it's quite silly to be honest. Um, Basically, it was just when we when we started this uh, this franchise mode on my channel. Um, obviously, I knew none of the teams, and I was just scrolling through this list of like thirty two teams. I was like, "That's just this is crazy, man." Like, obviously, you know, I guess for them, like being an F one fan, there's only ten teams to worry about, or like uh, you know, like a, being a Chelsea fan, there's only twenty teams to worry about. So having like a list of thirty two was just like baffling to me. Like that was insane. Um, so all of my chat were just kind of like, do you know what? The most well-rounded team on this game is the San Francisco 49ers. And I was like, all right, well, we'll try them then. Cause you know, when you're like first starting a game, you need to like boost your ego, right? You need to start with like some really good stuff and, uh, at least convince yourself that you're like semi good at the game. So I was like, okay, well, if they're well-rounded and good at everything, then, um, I guess we'll play as them. And then it just kind of like happened. Like, obviously I guess with playing with that one sole team i started remembering like the players and you know who plays where and uh, like the first name i remembered was jimmy garoppolo because i just thought what an incredible name that is um and obviously with him being quarterback he was at the time like he was so heavily involved with everything so i just remembered oh yeah like garoppolo um and then george kittle came pretty quickly uh just because he's an absolute beast on the games and just catches everything no matter how bad my passing is he'll just kind of seem to come away with it so those two kind of very quickly um got stuck in my head and then yeah the rest just kind of came with it so i guess my lazy brain was just like you know what i know that team i quite like them let's just go with that um and then started watching their games and now it's just a a, a crippling feeling that i can't seem to stop liking them so i guess they're my team now <laughs> good stuff and then one of the guys alex uh, alex simpson watching yeah did the so he's saying did the same thing playing oh, on the yeah. n64 many years ago oh back in the day yes back my man day. that's what we're i like. remember what was the first uh nfl quarterback 96 or something maybe it was like the oh. first i know yeah showing my age a little bit there but yeah <laughs> um and and yeah that's that, that's where i started sort of getting into the game but yeah it's a it, it's it's funny we have all got a bit of a different tale of kind of how we've fallen into the nfl and and, and how we found our team it's always interesting to discuss so how Let's did you get into it. the cowboys then how how did how did yeah. that come about so mine came about is i tried to get into the nfl a couple of times because i've got a really good friend who was screaming at me for ages that i need to watch this sport i need to get in and, and i tried it and i just couldn't the first couple of times yeah. and then i was at university and there was a monday night football game on and one of the guys who I was living in halls with was a big Philadelphia Eagles fan. And oh, it, nice. It was Eagles Cowboys on Monday Night Football, and I stayed up and watched it with him. And he, to, for the sake of balance, it was like, well, if you, you follow Philadelphia, I'm going to support the Cowboys. And then yeah, it just yeah, stuck. Yeah. It was a great game, shoot, a, a high-scoring shootout. I think it was 41-38, the end score. Uh, just back and forth like a basketball game. It was amazing. And I was hooked from from, from there. So, yeah, it took me a couple of goes, but that was it. And because I'd, I'd 
followed that team for that game. That was my team then. And I think Eagles Cowboys has got to be a quality first game to watch as well. Like that's a that's a big deal. That's a big game. Yeah, it was a big mid season game with kind of big playoff implications and division yeah, yeah. implications. So yeah, it was a good one to watch. I, I got lucky because it could have been a dud, and I could have been like, mm-hmm. no, I don't, I don't want to watch this anymore. But yeah, I got lucky, and then 15, 15 16 years later, here, here we, we are. are. <laughs> interviewing people about it and making content about it and, yeah so it yeah. must have been a pretty good first game then to uh yeah. <laughs> for you to still be here yeah still here, yeah and the trials and tribulations of following following the dallas cowboys um and, and yes. all through that we're still here um, <laughs> let's have a, a, a talk about kind of the upcoming season then for the 49ers so last year kind of all the adversity that the san francisco 49ers had with the injuries at quarterback yeah, play Mr. Irrelevant uh, as starting quarterback in Brock Purdy it turned out to be a bit of a gem. Mm-hmm. The playoffs and what happened in the NFC Championship game, in Philadelphia. How do you kind of how do you feel about kind of the Niners coming off twenty two, heading into twenty three? Uh, I mean, I feel like the Forty ers camp is such a such a strange one to be in right now. Um, because I think when you when you look at the whole roster, right, it is just superstars everywhere. And, um, you know, I, I understand that I'm very privileged to be in that position, right? You know, you see, um, like some franchises that for as long as like I've been into the NFL have just been like nowhere near competitive. And I, I can assume it's probably been, you know, harder from like since before that as well. Um, but I, I think the 49ers are just such a strange team to be so, um, like so invested in, because although you've kind of got all these stars everywhere, the most important position in football we just have no idea who's going to be playing there like come come week one and um you know it must be important they made a whole netflix series about it right so like you know this this position's got to be a pretty big deal um so for that to be the place we kind of don't know what who we have um feels kind of scary but i think if anything from from following the niners is that i i have learned to just have faith in carl shanahan because it it doesn't really seem to matter like who's under center will kind of just make it work yeah. um and i think the way the the way the team is built with they're just being kind of superstars everywhere i don't think we necessarily need like i don't know the way like buffalo need like josh allen to just play his heart out every game for them to for them to get moving we don't necessarily need that because we've just got so many weapons um which is why i think i, I mean I, I didn't really ever think i'd say this but if it comes to it and you know sam darnold is potentially playing our our first game for us we'll probably be okay like we'll be serviceable i mean we went through well four quarterbacks last year and um even when we brought in our fourth choice before he also got injured um you know we looked serviceable whereas you know some teams like the dolphins or the ravens when qb1 gets injured like that's it teams are done um so i think the fact we've we've kind of shown we're resilient makes me like not that worried about it but i think it's always going to be like you know i I feel like we should know who's qb1 by now you know and i think there's it's a great point you made there matter around i think the 49ers are the only team in the nfl that would be able to kind of manage that situation of going through maybe not the fourth or maybe josh johnson was a step too far in the (laughs) NFL championship game but you, you know i don't think any other franchise would have been able to manage and juggle three starting quarterbacks dealing with the injuries and still being able to play the same way mm-hmm. um i just i don't think any other team would have been able to to do that and and that is a lot down to carl shanahan absolutely yeah. and there's this kind of you know i suppose line for it that any any quarterback not named carson wentz will be able to thrive in in carl shanahan's <laughs> offense and, and i think it's, it's, it's kind of proving that of, of kind of the guys he's had to kind of plug in and play there if i mean let me ask you kind of i suppose a, a question question to who would you want it to be um, as the starting quarterback? And who do you think it will be come week one? So I will admit, I may have got a bit carried away uh, with everything that happened last year, but I'm I'm full on the Brock Purdy train right now, just because I think the way he seemed to just um, like captivate that squad and, you know, all the, all the players really responded well to him and like really respected him. And I never necessarily got that feeling when we were warming up with Trey Lance to be QB1. Um, I do think though, I, I guess to answer your question, ideally I would want it to be Brock Purdy. I think he's proven that he can he can do the job. He gets the offense going, the team are all behind him. And like I guess to me, that seems like a very solid option. Who I think it's going to be, I feel like it's probably going to be Lance under center come week one, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing. I think when we've, we've obviously invested a lot of draft capital and stuff to get this guy in the first place and um 
I think we haven't been able to see too much of him. Obviously, the one and a half games he played at the start of um, the start last year aren't really fair to judge him on. You know, he had like a, a monsoon in week one and then um, week two got injured. He obviously didn't also have uh, Christian McCaffrey available to him, which, you know, let's let's be honest. He was an incredibly big part of our offense last year. So, you know, that's that's also a big difference that he didn't have um, didn't have that weapon available to him. So I think I I want it to be Brock Purdy, but I think we do need to give Lance a, a proper run out and actually see, you know, what he can um, what he can do just so we know, you know, what what the situation is. I think it, we know that Brock Purdy can be plugged into this offense and it will be absolutely fine. So, you know, if we do play Lance and he's not that great, then it's not really the end of the world to me. Yeah, it's interesting because I think yeah, you. I, I agree. I still don't think you'd know what you've got in Trey Lance yet, mm. and um, I think you need to find, ultimately you need to find out. And yeah, there's yeah. no there's no other way you're going to find out than playing him in playing him in live games where the you know where there's live bullets flying around. So um, an interesting point. We've got the guys from Bottom Line Sports watching along. I think it's flow high flow. Um, an interesting take. Isn't isn't it time to call Trey Lance a bust? <sighs> Listen, uh, yeah, that's what I mean. I'm. I'm fully on the Brock Purdy train, like a hundred percent, but I just, I just don't think he's had enough of a crack at the whip yet for, for like to full on say that. And I'm not necessarily saying that isn't the case because, um, you know, I, like I said, I'm so, I'm so all in on Brock Purdy. I, I feel like I've mentioned that about 1200 times already, <laughs> yeah, but, <it's> um, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm so in there, but uh, I don't know. I think, if he's given maybe five, I don't know, because how I guess an NFL season is really hard to quantify, right? I feel like if you've got like, say like a Premier League season, for example, there's less teams in it, but you're playing 38 games, right? So you've got a much longer time to kind of experiment with things and see if things are working and you can probably give people more time. But let's say Lance plays the first three games, plays well, but loses all three of them. That's already you know quite potentially damning for the rest of your season unless you realistically go on and win most of the games you have left so i i feel like the nfl is is kind of dangerous like you don't really have that much time to figure out what's working before it kind of needs to work right yeah, I think we've we've seen the stats on on bad starts around kind of your odds of getting in the playoffs if you go zero and two, and maybe zero and two is not as damaging as it once was. But certainly if you go zero and three, zero and four, yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't very often make it into the postseason from there. So, um, and let's let's, let's talk about the early season. The, the schedule for the Niners is an interesting one. A bit, a bit of a mix. Is are there any kind of particular highlight games that you see, or games that you're looking forward to more than more than others, or more than most um, in the 49ers schedule for the season, Matt? Here? Ah, uh, see, I think I'm, um, I think I'm kind of just excited to take it sort of game by game at the moment. I, I feel like I, like I said, I think with not necessarily knowing who that QB one is going to be, I'm not really focused too much on the bigger picture. Like I'm, I'm confident in this team. I'm sure we're going to be absolutely fine. But I think at the moment, or at least at the start of the season, it's going to be very much a, a like testing phase for us. I think just, just personally, um, I always really look forward to like the the divisional games like i i love those like it's like in you know it's like when chelsea play against another london team like it is there's just something special about it and um i think it's it's very ingrained in me my my hatred for the rams so any any game against the rams i'm so up for it all the time because it just it feels massive like i know there was the season we obviously beat them twice in the regular season and then the game we come up against them to go into the Super Bowl and you know that fourth quarter we I hate to say it but we kind of did bottle it a little bit we kind of had it um in our hands and just couldn't make it through and obviously you know the the Rams are in a bit of an interesting spot right now so it's going to be exciting to see them um but to be fair actually thinking of divisional games I know the Cardinals aren't looking fantastic for next season um the Rams who knows? Because that roster is like 95% rookies, except for like Cooper Cup, Matt Stafford and Aaron Donald. Other than that, it's just uh, it's just rookies. But I'm really looking forward to us playing the Seahawks this season, actually. I think their draft has been good. I think they've invested in that squad well. And I, I'm re- like, I think that's going to be such a good um, such a good test to see like how how we've progressed as well as them, to be fair. They, I think they're looking a much a much better outfit this season. And I mean, they got into the playoffs last season. 
Yeah, I think the, the moves that the Seahawks have made in this offseason, in particular the draft, um, mm. have, have have been spectacular. Really. I think, you know, to get Jackson Smith and Jigba, and the drafted Weatherspoon, didn't it's kind of uh, a corner to, to shore up some uh, a potential weakness there. They're in a real good spot and I'd uh, be interested in if Geno Smith can do what he did last year yep. because there's, there's the talent around the Seahawks to, to, to make a big leap in 2023. The Rams are an interesting one, as you pointed out as well. Are kind of there suffering for all the moves they made to go and win that Super Bowl and yeah. win that championship um, the season before last. Um, so they might be struggling for a little while, um, but we shall see. Uh, Alex was chiming in on the chat with Simpson on the uh, bit of bit of a defensive. Trey, uh, Trey Lance, which I think we need some balance, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, he's, you know, he's not busting. There was a reference around him being, you know what you had in Patrick Mahomes. Not everybody can be Patrick Mahomes, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's a shame, but not everybody can. Um, but yeah, certainly he's not bust yet. They need to keep him to find out. Um, and yeah, let him go. Um, you know, you don't want him to come back and haunt you, I guess, which was the, the, the key point there around letting him go and him turning into a very good NFL quarterback. Yeah, which I'm, I mean, like I said, I completely agree with. You know, it might be that, Trey Lance start the season and he does absolutely ball out or maybe just does, you know, what Brock Purdy did to a to a slightly higher level. Because I do think probably when you're looking at them just as like base prospects, I think Brock Purdy is really good at doing what we need him to do. Uh, you know, like he gets through his reads quickly. He can scramble if need be. You know, he was just sort of had that good chemistry with the team. But probably in terms of both players I probably would say maybe Lance does have potential for a higher ceiling probably so yeah I I totally agree we definitely need to find out exactly what what we've got in him rather than yeah we can't just call him a bust already it's, he's not had enough uh he's not had enough time on the field I don't think yeah and this, this is gonna this is gonna be one I think that's gonna rumble all the way through until Shanahan names a starter um yeah it's one for training camp that you, Brock but it was cleared to to participate in training camp yesterday um, speaking of which, training camp started, and I, I, is there anyone from the 49ers, somebody maybe that we don't know as well, we know about all the superstars, is there somebody we don't know or haven't heard of as much that we should be kind of keeping an eye on that may kind of uh, have a bit of a breakout party through training camp? Ah, see, not that I can think of off the top of my head. I think the main the main story I'm, I'm sort of focusing on right now is um, I know obviously there's been uh, a bit of a commotion around Nick Bosa at the moment and he's he's holding out, um, which I would just like to say, fair play. Like that man is an absolute machine and um, he definitely, uh, definitely deserves the bag. So I feel like that's the thing I'm kind of most focusing on at the moment, but I don't know. I obviously I like training camp. It's a good, you know, it's a good, um, it's a good way to kind of start assessing your rookies, maybe. But I feel like training camp's kind of weird. It's it's a bit of a strange um, time, you know. You get kind of so many stories coming out of training camp, and like I know the one that's flying around at the moment is that like you know Sam Darnold has been like looking quite good in practices, and it's like, ah, uh, like. Uh, like I guess so but they also kind of have to say that right like they're not going to say oh he's looked terrible um so I feel like training camp you can only kind of take so much from it right I feel like you have to kind of take things with like a little pinch of salt and I think only when the preseason sort of really gets underway or I guess although even then it's kind of experimental like I think until you get week one firmly under your belt that's the real kind of litmus test I guess right that's when you kind of see L, you know, all that time, all that work that's gone into it, that's when it finally comes together and you get a, a better picture of where you are. So, yeah, I think training camp has to be taken with a pinch of salt, I think. Yeah. And I think when you get those kind of stories that leak or come out of training camp, there's always, you've always got quite a question who's mm. leaving them, where they've come yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. It's got a hand in it. There's something in it for, for that person leaking. So, yeah, always got to take a pinch of salt. But it does mean we're one step closer to football, right? I think we're about six oh, weeks yes. away now. Six weeks away from from kind of kickoff. Um, so we're getting closer. We'll not, not be too far from hard knock starting. That tends to be the feeling I get when hard knock starts. That's when kind of, right, football's back. Um, but let's stick with the Niners. And where do you think the Niners are? How far do you think the Niners go in 2023? Um, yeah, what do you think ends up, ends up with the Niners? <sighs> See if if we get our quarterback situation sorted i really do think we could make it to the super bowl i'm not necessarily saying we could win because obviously you know the the afc is 
ridiculously stacked from kind of head to toe. Like the, the teams in the AFC are, are crazy. Like even when you think of the teams that don't even make it to the playoffs in the AFC, like it's it's insane. Some of the some of the quality on on that side of the um on that side of the league. But I I think we we showed it last year. We're kind of good at winning games dirty right like you know teams like um like philadelphia and obviously like you know like dallas like the chiefs and stuff they can if they're not having a good defensive game they can just outscore you like that can just be their thing but we've kind of shown that we can do it the other way right like not even not even just to rub it in there sounds bad but like our game against the cowboys in the playoffs last year it it was not high scoring like neither team were looking fantastic on offense and they were two incredibly good defenses as well, by the way. Um, but it would it just kind of our level just seemed to sort of step up that little bit more just because it was that almost like dirty, like grinding out type game. Like it wasn't wasn't, you know, just like an absolute score fest, like a game between two teams that good could be, like we saw in the Super Bowl. Um, so you know, I feel like I'm quite happy because it seems like we can win games both ways. We're not afraid to you know, just grind out a really low scoring game if we have to, or we've got the weapons on offense to to win like that. But, you know, I'm also aware it would be foolish of me not to potentially question some things like our, our fourth quarter management sometimes isn't fantastic. You know, like I think of how the Super Bowl against the Chiefs, obviously I wasn't into the NFL at the time, but I've I've gone back and watched it previously. And it looks like that game probably could have been managed better. And, and like I mentioned earlier, what happened against the Rams. So maybe sometimes game management does need to be looked at. Um, we do also have off weeks as well. Like I, I think, was it our game against the Raiders last year? I want to say where they had a rookie quarterback and he ended up throwing for like a ridiculous amount of yards on us and it went to overtime and it was all very like, you know, that feels like a game we should have just put away rather than it getting that kind of tense. Um, yeah, I think if, if everything goes well, then I, I really do think this team could go all the way, but I feel like there's only so long we can kind of keep consistently being that good. It feels like eventually there's, there's bound to be a, be a drop off, which is what I'm worried about. But you know, I, I'm here as a Niners fan. I got to say, we're going to win the whole thing, baby. I believe. The whole thing. <laughs> and, and, I, and Alec, Alex Simpson agrees with you. 17 and 0 in Super Bowl winners. <laughs> points i'll have some whatever whatever alex simpson's having yeah that seems right cmc is going to run for two million yards and it's just (laughs) going to be an insane season yeah i completely agree i like this man (laughs) yes absolutely and there's you know there's a great point you made there around the the 49ers where the the games they lost last year were against teams that i I think think there was so much more telling than the ones we won i think that was kind of what had me worried a little bit I think the, the Broncos are on there as a team that beat the Niners. Yeah. The Bears, who are the worst team in the NFL. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting, maybe, you know, those off weeks that when they, they are, they're really big, they really switch off a lot, you know, and, yeah. and really just do do implode. But, yeah, I think the Niners, I think the Niners will be there or thereabouts. I think at a minimum, they'll probably get to the NFC Championship game again. Mm-hmm. I really like some of the matchups they've got in the regular season. You know, that there, there are going to be rematches against Dallas in week five on Sunday night football. Dallas go, go into Santa Clara again to try and get revenge for the two playoff uh, losses in a row. San Fran, San Fran go to Philadelphia in the regular season. That's going to be good. NFC, That's going to be a fantastic game. NFC Championship game that looks, you know, that and that's going to be shaped up nicely, no doubt. And another one that I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing, um, San Fran play the Bengals. So I'm really interested to see how they match up against kind of one of the better teams in the AFC, or what should be one of the better teams in the AFC. So yeah, yeah. Has been the last couple of years. Cool, 49ers uh, to win it all, book it. Why um, not? I mean, look, man, you know, you got to represent your team, haven't you? I mean, come on. Uh, you know, whether I'm, whether I'm actually that confident, uh, off, off screen about that, you guys yeah. don't need to know that. I, right. Yeah, man, we got this easy 17 and 0, like you said, clear by 40 points. We got this. So the sports book and the bookies at the minute have, uh, San Francisco as the fourth, the fourth favorite for the Super Bowl at nine to one or plus 900, depending where you're watching from. Yeah. See, this um, is, this is the thing I think that feel, like, I feel like gives me faith in this team like imagine literally any other nfl franchise being that high up the pecking order to win the super bowl when we don't know who our first choice quarterback is like could you imagine if we had this figured out by now like we like i mean come on could you imagine 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and and like we said before, you know, the only team that can probably deal with it. But yeah, having that <laughs> kind of solid number one, no doubt, would certainly make a big, big difference. Uh, yeah, the nine is nine to one behind the Bills, the Eagles, and the Chiefs. Unsurprisingly, is the no, the, that's the, that's the reasonable yeah. favorites. Um, but yeah, I see, like I said, you know, the Niners there. I think they're at the top of the NFC with Philadelphia. I think they're the two clear best teams in the in the conference. Dallas may be a little bit behind. Um, and then I think you've just got the rest, really. But yeah, I'm really excited to see how, how 2023 rolls out. And I think the NFC, again, is going to be between those three teams. Um, let's park the Niners. And we're going to park the NFL, which is not something I often do. Uh, but as this is a different show. We've got the freedom to do it. Get you a bit crazy. Why not? Absolutely. Yeah. You referenced it and talked about it already that you follow Chelsea um, over here in um, in England. That's your football team. Um, yeah. What a the last few years it's been for Chelsea. Um, the highest of highs winning the European Cup, uh, Champions League. I can show my age, European Cup. Champions League beating, uh, beating City, sacking Tuchel, and then just kind of... What's gone on? Yeah, kind of what's happened, mate. You are asking the wrong guy. Yeah, I look. I don't know. I I remember. You know, poor, um, poor naive me. Probably like, uh, well, I guess it might be almost like two years ish ago now. Um, I remember I literally did a show with Dan whilst the um whilst the takeover was uh was taking place, and I remember you know silly little me was all all optimistic, and I was like, oh, you know, I've I've never had a new owner before. This is exciting. And I was like, you know, I'm, I definitely mentioned that. I was like, it could go wrong. I was like, you know, look at, you know, people like uh, like Man United or, or Arsenal who aren't happy with their owners. I was, I was fully, fully um, admitting that it couldn't go wrong. Um, but I think I just thought, you know, whoever takes this over is going to have such a such a winning formula. Like how much realistically do you have to change? You know, um, silly me. That was obviously very, very silly, uh, because I guess when you spend like four billion pounds on something, which is probably something I'm never going to do. <laughs> Um, you probably do want to make uh, make changes and make it your own. I just didn't realize quite how your own uh, they wanted to make it. Um, yeah, we've had an interesting uh, bit of time. Uh, I think I've been pretty frustrated. Uh, would would be the best way to say. It. I think we've. It's just felt very like scattergun. Like we've just been playing FIFA in real life, right? We've just seen like young players with you know probably good potentials we'll just buy all of them and hope like a couple of them stick to the wall um we spent like quarter of a billion pounds on players that Tuchel wanted and then sacked him after like six games which just felt oh that oh i'm still annoyed about that to be honest um then you know we brought in such a fantastic manager thomas yeah yeah yeah. and just a a real real strange one um and i don't know again your point around the new owner making the mark just seems odd to spend all that money and then just not give him time, the time to, to do anything with it. Yeah, it, it, it was odd. And there's a question from Alec again. Uh, it would be a bit of criticism for us to talk about uh, our football, soccer, oh. if you will. Um, but, you know, we've got to do it. We've got some balance. Um, should Graham Potter have had more time? We've not even come to Potter being hired yet. But, yeah, do you think Graham Potter should have got some more time? Oh, so I think this is an interesting one because I think under – any other regime i think potter would have been a fantastic hire i think he's a he's a great coach and i i genuinely don't like i hope that his stock hasn't been damaged too much by his time at chelsea because i think whoever you plugged and played into that situation it it probably wouldn't have worked right like you know i thought of 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 someone like i don't necessarily think he's the best manager in the world but i really thought frank lampard might have been able to like g up the team because i guess like he knows what it means to play for chelsea but you know that didn't work either um I'm going to say no to the Graham Potter thing, but purely because I just, I do not believe that Chelsea was the project for him. He's always been a very, um, I guess, like quite quiet in terms of like being a manager. I feel like to be like a proper, like Chelsea manager, I think that's why I love Tuchel. Like he was running down the pitch, celebrating, getting in there with the fans, very sort of like loud and open person, which Graham Potter just isn't. And that is totally fine. Like he's not that kind of person. But when you have a manager like him, who's a very long project guy, quite quiet, just likes to go about his business, doing his own thing. And then you have an owner who is the polar opposite to that, really, and was just kind of splashing all this money, bringing in all these signings and stuff. It was never really going to work. And I, if anything, I kind of feel bad that he was 
put in that situation in the first place. Um, so I, I'm going to say no, just because I I just genuinely do not believe that the combination was right. I think there were probably other opportunities that would have been better for him. Like I think maybe at, at a club like Tottenham, maybe where like the, the vision is a bit more sort of long term and, and that's sort of the way they do this. I, I think he'd have been phenomenal for them. And like I said, I really hope his stock hasn't been like damaged too much from his time at Chelsea because I can see how a, a job like that and the backlash and stuff could like full on ruin a career. Um, and I really hope that's not the case. I think he's a phenomenal manager. I just I, the match never seemed right for me personally. Yeah, and I, I was very worried for Graham Potter when kind of when he got the job at Chelsea mm. um, because of I think the the approach you write in terms of how kind of how he approached things and you've seen that in his career in terms of you go for as far back as as the kind of work he did in working in Sweden. Mm -hmm. What he's kind of then come and done at Brighton, and I think he probably just needed more time at Brighton, and I think you know he probably needed a couple more seasons. Maybe you know Brighton are in Brighton are going to be in Europe, right? Which is, is crazy thinking about kind of where they <laughs> yeah. come from. Yeah, um, you know maybe he could have took Brighton into Europe, and you know and and maybe another three four years at Brighton. But I understand it's not the way people want to work anymore, uh, yeah. and, and people don't have that time and and, and give a you know six seven eight years to a to a team anymore and there's a bit of you know him wanting to push push on and i just think it was a it was a big big mistake i had to turn down and i think you know when a club the size of chelsea comes calling for you it's very very difficult to say no but you've got to make sure that that is the right fit and it's the right project and yeah the scattergun approach which is the word you use took it right out of my mouth so i was gonna say hey, the scattergun approach transfers just hasn't helped and he's left with a group of players who he's very demanding tactically. I think Graham Potter mm -hmm. players to be flexible and to change system, change systems a lot mid game. Um, you know, five and ten minutes at a time as well. I think we've seen yeah, 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 changing systems. So yeah, and I don't think he just had the players around him that were capable of, capable of doing that. Um, the clear out started, hasn't it? Oh, clear out started. It's, it's well on its way. Oh, yes. um, Mason Mount, Kante, Kovacic, Mendy, um, Aspilicueta, um, there's more, and I'll probably forget, uh, Loftus-Cheek, um, probably hudson Adoy. We've sold go. more players than other squads have, just periods. Like, it's it's mental. Like I, I think that was another one of our problems, to be honest. Just the squad was so bloated like you were never going to be able to keep everybody happy let alone try and build any fluidity like that whole situation was just so toxic but um yeah god we needed to get rid of some players and, and we're actually doing quite a good job of it to be fair yeah we're doing really good. and actually getting some decent fees for some of the players as well um which which you know when you when teams know that you need to get rid of players um yeah you know typically you might not get them one that just seems like a bit of just a I don't know, an anchor is, uh, and people may use other words to describe him, is Romelu Lukaku, who you just <laughs> can't seem to get rid of. Oh, this guy makes me laugh, man. It's so, like, it, at this point, it just feels a little bit like Jeremy Kyle, doesn't it? Like, come on. I mean, like, every, I'm pretty sure he's kissed the badge of, like, every club he's been to. And yet, somehow he just manages to keep snaking out each team that he's been to and it, it seems to just kind of progressively get worse like you know on his uh like on his way out of, where did he go so he went from manchester united to inter right yeah. that was the right okay so like you know on his way out of manchester united everybody hated him at united and then you know he was loved at inter like everything seemed great and i thought you know what like I, i'm genuinely happy for him I'm like, ah, fine you know he's he's happy the inter fans are happy Obviously, Inter's financial situation being what it is, he makes his way to us. And at the time, I thought, God, that seems like a hell of a lot of money for this guy. But I was like, do you know what? If if he just starts cracking in goals, which is what we definitely need, um, not that we already had it in Tammy Abraham and sold him anyway. But I thought, fine, you know, whatever. If we if we bring in Lukaku and he starts cracking in goals, then excellent. And um, to be fair, he did. He did for a little bit. And then the Sky Italy interview happened, and that was like, okay, that's that's like you know, going out with a new girlfriend and kind of straight away being like, oh, I miss my old girlfriend, you know, you're just not quite the same. And I thought, ah, oh, that's an interesting move. You know, then he goes back to Inter and he complains how we won't release him and we're terrible people. And then whilst he's at Inter preparing for a Champions League final, he's also flirting with Juventus after saying that Inter's like the only club for him. And it's like, what are you doing, man? Like genuinely, I, 
are the people around him advising him just like what like i i do not understand like how do you manage to just make everyone this angry i don't he, get it he does so i follow manchester united and i had two years of him and when he came which tends to be the, a bit of a theme with lukaku i thought it was going to be absolutely incredible yeah. we had Mourinho at the time we paid everton a fortune i think it was 90 million quid oh, was a lot of money wasn't it yeah. something close to that and and I thought it was going to be absolutely incredible. You know, he's going to have Mourinho. Mourinho was going to know how to use this yeah, big, the bullish, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, big bullish centre forward. And yeah, it just didn't pan out like that. It was good for me. It was really, it was good for the first season. So he got 20 odd goals. And then once Mourinho got sacked, Ollie didn't fancy him. He didn't fit in with the way that he wanted to play, counter attack mm. football. When he's at it, and when you, and I'm sure you can, if he can get him in the right frame of mind, he's a big old fashioned bully centre forward who smashes in goals. But yeah, you just can never seem to get him in that mind mindset, and he's become he's going to become very very difficult to get rid of. I think just because of the money and you know you are what you are at this point in your career. People know what they're going to get from you, and and, and people aren't going to like what they're going to get from you based on based on his behaviour. And let's talk about something more positive. <laughs> Mauricio Pochettino in at Chelsea. Um, what do you think around kind of the moves that they've made and, and what do you think Poch is going gonna, is gonna to bring to Chelsea? Well, I, I never thought I'd see Pochettino in the, in the Chelsea dugout, to be fair. You know, if you'd have asked me from like five, six years ago, you know, would you want Poch as manager? That would never have even crossed my mind. Um, but to be honest, the more I'm the more I'm settling into it, I actually think this is a this is a quality appointment. Like I think if you look at the work he actually did at Spurs, like getting the best out of really young, talented players. Like, I mean, you know, we saw the best Deli Ali under under Pochettino, as well as, you know, a lot of other players. Um, so I think given the the state of the squad right now, that's an incredibly sensible appointment. I think, you know, he he should be able to sort of mould these young players. And I think watching some of our um our preseason tour games in America, like I know quite a few Premier League teams are out there at the moment. Um, we've actually just seen so much like tactically from us that I feel like we haven't seen in so long. And I think for the first time in well, at least a at least a year, we genuinely look so up for it. Like players are working hard. I think I've been really impressed with Nicholas Jackson um and Kunku's looked fantastic so far as well um I think the the one thing I'm a little bit scared about is we just feel very like very thin at midfield at the moment I know we've obviously got got rid of a lot of midfielders and I guess at the moment it's kind of like at least centrally it's kind of like Enzo and Conor Gallagher I know we've got kind of youngsters like Chukwameka and stuff but in terms of like you know fully blooded in like first team players that feels about it um it feels like we've been chasing Caicedo for about six years and that's just still not happened somehow um and apparently now Gallagher might be going to West Ham which feels like worrying um so you know if, if it's just Enzo running midfield by himself then I guess we'll just have to work with that um but yeah I, I I'm actually feeling quite optimistic now I think you know like I said for the squad we have he actually seems like we've done something that Chelsea don't normally do and actually made quite a sensible decision <laughs> Yeah, and we've got a question from the, the guys at the bottom line sports and uh, Flo. And so I spell it says I spell Aquetta, who is, should go down as one of the Premier League's all time great defenders. Um, I love absolutely big fan of Aspel Aquetta, and I'm sure Chelsea fans are as well. Absolutely, yeah. he's gone uh, to I was going or if not, he's gone to Atletico Madrid, uh, which leaves a space for a captain. And the question is, will uh, Pochettino give Reese James the armband? If not Reese James, who might it be? No, I hope so. I I really hope so. I think Rhys James is is an incredible, like genuinely incredible um, footballer. I think the way he like commands himself on the pitch as well. Like I, I feel like you know some players just have that that presence. Like he's just he is just a genuine presence on the field. And I feel like he leads by example as well. I feel like I always used to um, like compare. Reese James and and Mason Mount quite a lot, and I I loved both of them. And as much as I would like to say I openly hate Mason Mount, no, I really don't. Um, but you know, I I think one of the things I quite liked about Mason Mount is he's like he's quite a feisty player, right? Like when when things are not going well, like he's he's up for it. But I sometimes feel like that kind of works against him. Like I think he can sometimes get a bit too um, sort of frustrated and then kind of start playing badly. Whereas I feel like you know Reese James is like composure like even when things aren't going great and he's not necessarily the most vocal player but I don't 
think that maybe counts for as much as it used to. Like I feel like, you know, that probably, you know, a, like a while ago probably would have been a problem. And, you know, if your captain's not the loudest player on the pitch, people are sort of not having it. But I think leading by example is such a big thing. And I think he is such an important thing to like this club, this team. He just, like, I don't want to sound kind of cheesy, but he just feels very like proper Chelsea. Like that's just, the, I feel the only way to to kind of describe it, I guess. So I really hope it's Reese James. Um, I guess the only question is potentially about maybe his fitness. Like I know over the last couple of seasons, yeah. he's had quite a few injury worries, which is not ideal. Um, but yes, in an ideal world, I, I really hope so. I, I think he's fantastic. Yeah, Reese James, a scourge of fantasy football managers up and down the land with his yeah. inability to stay on the pitch, um, you know, from, from an injury perspective. And I'm sure there will be a point where he gets over that. It's odd that Chelsea have that problem both uh, with both wing-backs or full-backs. Ben Chilwell's exactly the same. Yeah, literally he's both brilliant. of them, yeah. He's brilliant, but just can never just, get him on the pitch. Can't, can't stay healthy, yeah. <laughs> can't, can't keep fit. Um, so, yeah, we, we'll wrap up shortly, but just a quick one on Chelsea. Where do you think they, how do you think the season pans out? Where do you think they can get to after kind of the disappointing mid-table finish last year? Oh, see now, I remember the last time we didn't have European football. Something very special happened uh, under a very special Italian man. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and chuck it out there. That's not happening again. <laughs> let's, just, let's just throw it out there, right? I think the, the competition we're facing is like a much higher standard than I, than I think it was back then because yeah it's just it's not happening but um I I think realistically I think I'd be quite happy if we just get maybe like a Europa League spot I think top four is an incredibly hard thing to break into now I think you know you've seen the seen the like ascendancy of like Newcastle and how they're building that team I think that's incredible I think assuming you're going to finish above city is always a scary thing um so you know probably not going to do that uh, as much as it really pains me to admit arsenal are you know they looked incredible last season at the have bottled it a little bit at the end but the investment they've put in so far this window is pretty scary like this the kind of window that we used to have um you know obviously you know united under 10 hog are looking solid i'm assuming you might want to like a bit more activity so far in the window, like obviously still not having an yeah. out and out striker, which is the most Chelsea problem I've ever heard in my life. Um, so... Harry Kane. I, I don't understand what what's so difficult at Manchester United. Just go by to do whatever it takes with heaven and earth to go and sign Harry Kane. Get Harry it done. Yeah, it he's happen. so proven as well. It's not yeah. even as if you're taking like a risk in buying him. Like it's it's just going to work. Um, anyway, yes, back to Chelsea. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think maybe top four is potentially a bit a bit wishful like I think this year is probably just like a like a consolidation season like obviously I think we should be miles better than last season and I'm not saying that we shouldn't be kind of pushing for top four but I think if come the end of the season if we've had maybe some decent cup runs and are sort of comfortably in the top six um, then I'll be happy with that obviously I we'll be wanting more than that. And I'm sure if it comes the end of the season and that's what we've got, I'll probably be all, you know, grouchy, like, oh, we should have won the FA Cup or something like that. But, um, you know, I think looking at it now, considering how bad it was last season, I think if we can just have a respectable season, um, then that's fine. But as we know, this is Chelsea. If we don't win things, then heads start rolling pretty fast. So, I mean, I know we need to be much more long-term than that. Um, but, We'll we'll see. I mean, it's Chelsea Football Club. Who knows? Literally anything could turn up next season. We have no idea. Half the fun, though, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, man. That's why we love it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I won't be surprised if Chelsea had a very similar season to what Manchester United did last year mm. in terms of kind of getting in that, getting in the top four and winning the League Cup or winning the FA Cup. Uh, just if City just decide they don't want to, so um, <laughs> yeah. But I wouldn't. I don't, I don't think Chelsea are as bad as that team. That the, you know, I don't think Chelsea was bad as what was shown last season um and yeah, that was exceptionally bad yeah. like it, it can't be that bad again it can't and, be. and the benefit of no europe and, and and you've seen when teams either don't have europe or just don't take europe seriously like arsenal did last year yeah what you can what you can go and do i think Ars you know, arsenal may be good again i don't know but i think they might be at risk i don't think they'll again with playing just having to play in europe newcastle having to manage europe sure 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 yeah, so it might, you know, it's going to be difficult for those teams, and I fully expect Chelsea to be close at least to that top four. Yeah, um, that's what I mean. I think as long as we're pushing like there or thereabouts, I'll be, 
I'll be I'll be happy. I think I, I can't be too complacent if it's better than last year. I guess is my point. You know, like uh, of all the times, if it's not going well, just think. You know what? It could be could be the 2022-23 season. It could be way worse. Could be worse. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Matty, uh, fifty minutes has flown by. Time does my fly gosh. when you're having fun, as they say. Um, I just want to say thank you once again for being on the show, the Paul Redmond Show here at Let's Talk Sport. Um, give us a, give us a shout out where we can find you again, Matty. Uh, so I'm on uh, Twitter at Smith99, or if you want to watch me on Twitch, where I'll, I'll probably be playing F1, FIFA, Madden, or I think at the moment I'm playing an Alice in Wonderland horror game because my friend told me to. Uh, she said I'd find it kind of creepy. So, you well, know, like we trust there. Yeah. I know. We just do random stuff. Um, so if you want to find me on any of those platforms, it's Smith99. Um, I also need to get back into making TikToks, which is just Matthew talking sports, which I know is not the same thing. It's not very branded. I know I'm terribly sorry. Um, but yeah, if you want to find me over there on any of that stuff, uh, then then please do. But um, no, Paul, thank you very much for having me, man. This this has been an absolute delight of a podcast. Today. I've really enjoyed this. No, no, thank you. It's been great talking to you. Um, and we'll be back here next week. Uh, same time, same place, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. UK time, 2 p.m. Eastern time here on the Let's Talk Sports YouTube channel, uh, where I'll have another guest. I don't know who it's going to be yet, but it'll be another guest. So make sure you join us next week. Matty, it's been a pleasure. Great to talk to you. See you soon. And we'll catch you all uh, this time next week. See you later. <laughs>